My name is Rick Hall. I'm a record producer. I own the recording studios here. Started here in 1962, I guess. Been here for most of my life. Rodney Hall. Uh, I work here at Fame and uh, also with the Muscle Shows Music Foundation, work in publishing, production, studios, selling t-shirts, sweeping the floors, taking out the garbage, <laughs> whatever it takes. <clears throat> well, I made it my business to be very visual and to go to other recording studios and watch the recording done, particularly in Nashville. At R.C. Victor Studios with Chet Adkins, who was a producer and an A&R person, head of A&R at R.C. Victor. Owen Bradley, who was the head of A&R at DECA. So I watched a lot of people do it and spent a lot of time writing songs and trial and error. I mean, most of the things I've learned over the years have been try it and if it don't work, try something else and so forth, you know. I figured that I knew better than anybody else did. Uh, so when people told me they didn't like a song, if I continued to like it, if I liked it and thought it was a hit, uh, I would spend my own money, go in the studio and, and try to prove them wrong. And of course did in a lot of cases, but the first record I did that in to answer your question is, was Arthur Alexander and You Better Move On, and I took it to about five or six different publishing companies and record companies, I didn't know the difference back then, so uh, wherever a door was open, I would go in and play my stuff. And so I was turned down by six or seven labels on Arthur's records, and most said it was too black for white and too white for black. Uh, and it was too R&B. It became a reality with me that uh, most producers didn't like anything that I had written. So it, <laughs> that, so was a wake up, that, that was a wake-up call, so I had to produce it myself. <laughs> so I started to, leaning towards producing records and engineering and, and kept my eyes and ears open all the time and decided that I wanted to learn every aspect of the business from the pressing plant to the producing of the record and the publishing of the songs and so forth. First time I met most of those guys, I I just thought there were people my dad worked with like anybody else. I didn't, it wasn't any, wasn't like starstruck, didn't know they were stars. And a lot of them weren't stars at the time. Uh, they became stars mm -hmm. later. But, uh, you know, really, I guess the first time I really, it really hit home was the Osmonds because that were, I was eight or nine and they were, Donnie was 12, and all the girls were going crazy over him, and so that got my attention. <laughs> but that was probably the first time I really thought anything other than these are just people that my dad worked with. But basically, they, they either stayed at the ranch in the hospitality trailers, and these were just, just tra I mean, they were, they were souped-up trailers. They were nice ones, but yeah. they were trailers nonetheless. Uh, and they either stayed there or at our house. Uh, and then when we built the house at the ranch, we had an apartment, and they, a lot of them stayed there. Mm -hmm. We had various artists out there, the Gatlin brothers. We had Mac Davis. He stayed there. Mac was more like family to us because he had his wife with him. And uh, Girl. Linda, a girlfriend Girl. at the time, but later they got, they got married, and now they yeah. have four or five grown boys, or yeah. two or three grown boys. And uh, he... Uh, he uh, stayed at the house, and we were like we were like brothers, and he was like family to us. And so he he usually just kind of made himself at home in the building wherever he wanted to go. Yeah, Mac definitely was more of a family member. He he recorded uh, fourteen albums here. I don't know if you knew that's how many, but mm -mm, more, I didn't know more that. than anybody uh, in that fame. <clears throat> uh, he recorded every hit he ever had, except for "Hard to Be Humble," which was a live record. My brother would come in late, and the the apartment, his bedroom was right below, right above the garage. So one morning he <laughs> cornered my brother and said, "Tell you what, next time you come in at two o'clock in the morning and raise that garage door, <laughs> me and you gonna be wrestling." 
he was one of the greatest songwriters I've ever, ever worked with. He was an incredible songwriter. He, he wrote things like Something's Burning, The Fifth Dimension, and Watching he, Scotty Grow. Watching Scotty Grow was a huge record. Uh, Stop and Smell the Roses. Uh, in the Ghetto. Baby, Baby, Don't Get Hooked on Me. In the Ghetto, which was a big hit, number one record on Elvis Presley. Casual Conversation, which so he was been a hit again friend recently. Lover, friend, lover, woman, wife. He was, he, he was a great songwriter. The Black Axe passed the word on me, particularly me, that if you want to hit a record, go to Rick Hall and Fame Recording Studios. They passed it on to the Otis Reddings and the Wilson Pickett's and the Clarence Carters and, and those people that we, we later cut a lot of hit records on. And so they were, they were, uh, they, they came to me and they needed me and I needed them. I needed an artist, a black artist that was happening back then. And, and that, at that era, by the way, uh, black acts were the biggest acts there were. I mean, you could break, I mean, you, if you had a number one R&B record, you could sell a half a million albums or a half a million singles, not albums, but they were never. Albums, too, albums really hadn't, that format hadn't that's taken right. off. No, it hadn't taken off yet. So, but you could, you could sell a half a million singles, but if you had a country hit, Number one record, you, you might sell 50,000, but there was a big difference in 50,000 records and 500,000. And we learned that the hard way, quickly. Even the records we're making today, you know, the Jason Isbells and the Drive-By Truckers and the, the uh, you know, uh, Band of Horses and different mm -hmm. things we're doing now, uh, Civil Wars and so forth. Don't you, you hear know, the influence in that? Oh, there definitely. There's definitely an influence from, from the <clears throat> 60s and 70s music onto that and I think people, these artists, they're hearing that and the old stuff and say, I want some of that. I think that uh, having the best musicians, the best songwriters, the best of everything in the room at one time is the way to cut records. I mean, that is the, that's the proven way. You gotta learn what it is about songs that makes people like them. Amen. 20 years ago, if an artist was selling 100,000 records, they'd be dropped from the label. Now, mm -hmm. if an artist is selling 100,000 records, they're a success. I think now we've got more young, up-and-coming, talented musicians and, and singers. And I think the song dictates who you use on the session. Right. I think it, the song dictates uh, the, the key of the record. The singer and the song has to be a perfect marriage. If you are not a perfect marriage between the singer and the song, I mean, I don't care how good the singer is, if this song don't fit that singer, you can't have a hit record. 